<laughs> if Clausewitz was alive. Uh, Clausewitz said that every, uh, how can I put this, every era and societal economic epoch has its own set of social norms, thinking, and ideas about the nature of warfare. I think he would be able to understand it, even though it's something that would be largely alien to his world, which of course is the French Revolution Napoleonic era. Um, in terms of how how we understand it. Um, I don't think, in part because Canada by its nature, as I sort of mentioned in my initial comments, we don't think big picture. When you're, you're talking about big understandings of the modern nature and the evolution of war and strategic interests. That's not the Canadian mindset. Canadian mindset has always been a level or two levels below. Uh, in World War II, when at the end of that war, even before the end of the war, Canada's contribution to the war effort was roughly the fourth largest military power in the world, where did we stand the higher levels of thinking? We didn't. We didn't want to, to talk to Churchill and Roosevelt. Uh, as the sort of the saying goes, Mackenzie King at the Quebec conference served lunch and tea. Uh, and there were political reasons why that was the case. Uh, I, I, I think it, the answer, the answer is difficult in my view. Part of it is trying to understand the extent to which uh, the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan is absorbed by the major allies, and particularly the United States, is basically the way we're going to follow. And that answer, if you look, if you think about the world as we are now, and project this as the world of the future for my rest of my lifetime, however long that might be, is a world where we're not going to do nation building anymore. That doesn't work. Uh, we're going to be very reluctant to commit ground forces to these events. Uh, we'll commit support, we'll commit air power because it's relatively cost-free to us. Uh, I, that may be the lessons we've learned from Afghanistan and looking at the American experience in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. Uh, what it means in terms of when we think about if we're headed for a major Cold War type, and I hate to use the word Cold War because it's misunderstood, but we're headed for, if we think about the American strategic pivot to Asia, if we're thinking about the evolution of an emergence of an adversarial relationship between Beijing and Washington, and how would then we will reply to that, uh, that will be largely to determine how that relationship plays out relative to Washington and how we perceive it. Everyone else will, will set the conditions for us to respond. I don't know if I've answered your question because it's a tough one to answer. Well, I'm going to answer it uh, from, a, from a different route because um, I think uh, Klaus would recognize it and I think one of the things Klaus has always said is you have to be ready to adapt. And so I would look at it, the sort of skill sets that I see the Canadian forces as perhaps lacking and missing and might need in the future. And when you look at, for instance, the United States, whereas they were looking to set up a cyber security environment, so, you know, not only Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, cyber, uh, we're not even close to that level yet. But if, if, if you're somebody who has any sort of cyber skills and you want to sign up for the military, I think you have a very bright future ahead of you for, for a variety of reasons. Um, I think the other one I'm surprised we're not seeing more of across all militaries is more forensic accountants. Because we've got to get a little bit smarter about getting ahead in these wars and tracking down the money. It is amazing to me ISIL has the amount of millions they have. Surely somebody could have seen this a lot earlier. And that's where um, the intelligence gathering capability of both security forces and the military I think needs to, to, to take a step up and forensic accountants I think would be would be a good area to get into. Um, uh, I, you know I, I, if I was a pilot I'd be looking to cross train in some other area. I, you know I think 
potentially. I don't see a lot of planes in the air. I see potentially planes being flown from a room and the planes are out there. But that doesn't necessarily mean you need a pilot. Um, I think if you're in the army and your artillery, I think that's, my, that's going to perhaps change as well as we've seen the nature of warfare in terms of what our land forces do. They're going to have to be not just infantry, if they are going to remain in the army, they're going to have to also take into consideration the state and civil power role, and they're going to have to cross train in a lot of different areas. Um, so I think Clausewitz would recognize it, but he would be the first to say to the Canadian military that you have to keep ahead of what might be the possible new threats and be prepared for them. So, sorry, if I could just follow up one more thing. I've got a question about one more obscure military theorist, do and air power. Well, you know, we were sort of laughed that at if, if I remember in my speech of studies course correctly, Jim. <laughs> Has it turned out that he was actually right about air power? Not necessarily that it wins worse, but maybe that's all that people are going to use. Politically, yeah. He, he has turned out, I think, for the foreseeable future, notwithstanding a great power confrontation, which will change the calculation, but he has turned out to be right. It's politically useful. It's very expensive, but relatively cost-free to governments because you can't touch us, the adversaries that we could currently confront, and if we project this future, they can't touch us. Uh, it enables governments to do things, to be seen to do things, to be seen to help him. Uh, regardless of the outcome at the end of the day of the war. Let me add one last point. Uh, the, I will call them the pro-military lobby, has argued repeatedly over the past many years that in order to keep up with the developments that are occurring in military technology, some of the things that Andrew has talked about, requires the Canadian government to spend roughly around 2% of GDP. What that means is that the current Canadian defense budget, which is roughly $18 billion, needs to be doubled to $36 billion. That's not on. It will never be on. No government will ever do that. And the pressures then on choice, hard choices within the military relative to thinking about where we want to invest, what we want to commit, become gr greater and greater over time. Because I see nothing that's going to change because society doesn't want it. There's no great push in society, even though, as I said, we've had this reawakening of support to the public support to the forces, social empathy and understanding and support for veterans, all that's occurred. But that is not matched with any sense of a political force which is going to tell the government, you must spend more. That breaks in a firm line. Yes, we love the forces. Yes, we love what they're doing. They're wonderful. We're great. Support them. Should we give them more and more money? No. I have to say, Brian, I also think command of the oceans is really, really important. And you can't do that from the sky. You have to actually have a blue water navy for that. And I think still in many cases. So, um, and now we're concerned about under the ocean and we're concerned about space as well. So <laughs> the military is about to get, you know, they, they could be a, a lot more involved on all sorts of uh, new frontiers. Well, I mean, I think it's historically fascinating. And, and it's very cool we found it. I don't know that we'll ever, ever be able to raise it because I'm not an archaeologist, but my my sense is that it's so delicate it, it would, you know, disintegrate if it actually you know, was subject to the pollution that we have up <laughs> in the Arctic. Um, I, I think he, the, the, the Harper government has made, and successive, let's, let's be clear, successive prime ministers have made the Arctic their signature piece, you know, from, uh, Pearson wrote about it when he was Secretary of State, the equivalent, uh, Trudeau on through. Um, what is it going to mean in terms of safety and security for, for uh, the Arctic? Um, probably disastrous because the first thing all the cruise ships are going to do is <laughs> beeline for that area. Um, and we haven't charted those channels. And so uh, if you are the military, guess what? You're going to be doing a lot more search and rescue. So <laughs> from the military standpoint, probably disastrous. 
Um, from a historical standpoint, I think it's very interesting, but we keep thinking this is a Canadian ship. Um, Franklin was English, and all his crew was English too, so I think we need to remember that. I guess my, I should have asked a more leading question. Do you think it has something to do along the lines of what we were talking about with the War of 1812 recognition, sort of establishing? Well, it, yeah, it, won't, it won't do anything in terms of a stat. First of all, nobody's ever said that the Northwest Passage isn't Canadian. Right. So whether we find the Franklin or not, it doesn't make any difference. No lawyer is going to say, yes, but look, we have no, this piece. Yeah. Of, yeah. Of, Differentiating ourselves from Americans, showing Canadians. Well, again, yeah, but the Americans would first be the first to say, right, weren't they British? Um, <laughs> they weren't Canadian. So uh, I, I'm not sure we want to play that card too much either. It, it, it's just, I think, historically fascinating. It's fabulous that Parks Canada is in the lead, that Parks Canada um, will remain in the lead. I think that's important. It should be Parks Canada. Um, and uh, so long as Everybody else in the world doesn't try and come to that part at the same time because we're, we're not ready for them. There's no infrastructure up there. There's, ah. uh, we need to have a plan about how we're going to deal with this increased traffic. Maybe if I could just add quickly, and partially to round up my comment about the War of 1812 from the first question asked, maybe the Prime Minister is just a history buff and he likes history. Maybe that's a similar explanation as that one. Uh <laughs>
people, resources that go with that. But so far, it, it's one that we seem to be able to maintain the, op the operational tempo. I'm not sure, though, if you ask that military themselves, if they're happy with the operational tempo, because it is difficult when we have forces in Lithuania, in, in Kuwait, we also have UN missions. Um, so it's going to be those unknown unknowns that come out of nowhere that's going to keep us scrambling. And that's why the Canada First Defense Strategy is actually important, because it's in these time of crises we want somebody to have thought through right, what should be our priorities so we're not making decisions you know, based on emotion and, and panic. Let me add one thing, and let me ask all of you, and don't misinterpret me because I'm not trying to be cruel. You are. Fine. <laughs> uh, the key issue is not the commitment of the Air Force or the airstrikes. The key commitment of Canada, which should be people should be talking about, is how many military advisors have we deployed? Where are they deployed? And what exactly are they doing? Because military advisors and trainers is a big category. And has anyone, any opposition party, any group in society, Canadian society asked those questions? The answer is no. What happened to you? Well, uh, I haven't had the opportunity. They see us coming and they lock the door. The <laughs> but that's the really interesting question. Uh, to my mind, that we should be asking. Now, what do we want trainers and advisors to do? But we're not talking about that's been pushed quickly into the background and was buried. Uh, the Americans announced recently that they're, I think they're doubling their ground commitment into Iraq. What does that mean for us? Is there going to be pressures now in Canada to do more, to send more? Maybe. Uh, what, are, what are those advisors doing, trainers, American trainers up to? And what are our, I mean, these are really the key questions in terms of political considerations, which I would expect people to be asking. But and all at a time when the military has to uh, find millions of dollars. Which they don't have. Which they don't have, yeah. so. So, so, so 15 is upon us, so please join me in thanking uh, Jim and Andrea for uh, a very interesting and important reason. Thank you again, and thank you all for coming out this evening. I'll invite you to join us on Tuesday, November 25th at the, free, at the McNally Robinson for our Cafe Politique, Understanding Energy in Manitoba. Once again, feel free to uh, fill out your feedback forms. Uh, we get a lot of our ideas from you, what you'd like to hear next. And uh, thank you again for coming this evening, and thank you for your questions. Have a great evening.